I would say, I would say, do your best as a kid. If you're in the game and, and something like that happens, do your best to to let your love of the game um, go ahead of what someone is saying to you, and don't let anyone um, turn you away from your what you love. Welcome to Hockey Culture, everyone. This is the place where we're trying to change the culture of hockey, one interview at a time. And today's special guest second person of color to don the NHL stripes, NHL linesman, Shandor Alfonso. Shandor, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me, Anson. Pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I don't typically talk to referees. I try to avoid you guys and linesmen as much as possible. But I have to say one thing. Like, I decided to put on this black and white shirt to show my respect. It's the closest thing I have to putting on the actual stripes of the National Hockey League. So that's why I'm wearing what I'm wearing today. Well, you should come to my house. As you can see behind me, I got a lot of them laying there everywhere in the house. <laughs> well, let's go back to you started playing hockey. Not everyone aspires to be an NHL linesman or referee. You're a hockey player first and foremost, which actually adds to your ability to become a referee because you've actually played the game. I want to go back to your minor hockey. Uh, what was that like growing up in Orangeville, which is just northwest of Toronto, Ontario? Um, you know, I had a blast playing minor hockey here in Orangeville, playing with my buddies. Um, you know, we used to play a lot of pond hockey, a lot of road hockey together, and then we'd get on the rink and, and go to games and practices. And, you know, we, we had, I got a lot of fond memories playing minor hockey here in Orangeville. Still have a lot of buddies um, to this day that I still talk to from, from the hockey days here in Orangeville. And when you're playing minor hockey, was it ever a goal of yours to play in the OHL and the NHL? Or were you just living the dream and just comfortable playing the game of hockey and just having fun with it? Well, you know, for us as a young kid growing up, I always wanted to play in the National Hockey League. Um, it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I realized that um, that the OHL and NCAA and, and those kind of opportunities were available to me. But growing up, the, the goal was always, as, as most young Canadian kids that, that play hockey, the goal was to make the NHL as a hockey player. And there wasn't that many players of color in the league. So it wasn't like you had that many people to look up to. Did that ever deter that dream? Or did it make that dream even stronger because there wasn't that many players of color playing the National Hockey League? Well, you know, well, there wasn't many. But I had, um, I had some, some great players like yourself and, and uh, Jerome McGinla and, and George LaRock. And I, I, we did have some players to look up to. And, and I remember playing minor hockey and, um, and, and thinking to myself, you know, Anson Carter's there with his dreads. Uh, Jerome McGinn there. They're both scoring goals, doing big things at high levels. Um, I remember thinking to myself, if they could do it, I could definitely do it too. So, so uh, you know, first and foremost, thank you for for being an inspiration for my generation uh, coming up for in hockey. Thank you. I mean, it's quite an honor. I mean, it makes me feel old when I hear someone talking about that stuff. Clearly, the dreads are gone because it's too hot uh, here in Atlanta. But I played against and with both George Larac and, and Jerome McGinn. Amazing people, uh, tremendous competitors, great hockey players, and even more better role models for people like yourself uh, coming up for the game. Did you ever feel that the color of your skin was an object that held you back from either making a team or, you know, going up the ranks when it came to hockey? Um, you know, fortunately for me, honestly, I, I never I never felt the color of my skin held me back. Um it w I was always a, a decent hockey player coming up. I was one of the better players on my team. And uh, I was a little bit of a target on the ice. On the ice, I, I felt held back a little bit because I was a little bit of a target where they sometimes, you know, players would use a uh, race to, to try and get under my skin because I'd be scoring goals or be putting kids into the boards. Uh, <laughs> that was one of my main things in my game. But um, I was a little bit of a target on the ice. But honestly, in my career – um, I, I was given every opportunity to let my play um, do all the speaking. And uh, I don't feel that the color of my skin held me back at all. And did your family feel safe and included when they went to the rinks? I know my mom and dad love going to games. And yes, we had racial incidents, but my teammates and their parents and my team made my family feel so comfortable that I, that isn't always the case. And it hasn't always been the case with kids, families playing the game of hockey. Um, I, that, that is, that is very true. But honestly, um, again, my, my family had nothing but great experiences. My dad's the type of guy that you, you meet him once and everybody loves him. So you know, the games that he didn't come to, everyone's like, Oh, where's your dad? He, you know, we'd love to see Wayne around the rink. Um, and you know, my mom, um, was the ultimate mama bear, you know, like she was the ultimate hockey mom, took us everywhere. 
and in the stands had our back. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think more people were um, afraid to to go after us for for race because they knew my mom was there and would have our backs for that. <laughs> so you finish playing hockey, you move into the financial world, you're working for RBC. What drew you back into the game of hockey to become an official? Well, quite honestly, I never left the game. Um, while I was working in, in the RBC world, uh, I was I was officiating at the time. So. When I finished my fifth and final year at Lakehead University, um, I, I went to uh, the NHL Combines that uh, Stephen Walken put on with the NHL. Uh, he brought Billy McCurry in um, and brought a bunch of guys that played the game at a higher level to try and get us interested in officiating. So after I graduated, um, I started officiating right away. I never, I never left the game. I was actually had a contract signed to go down and play in the Central Hockey League uh, for the Allen Americans uh, last minute, I decided to try the officiating out because I, I saw a friend of mine that who graduated the year before me, I uh, got into the OHL as an official, his second year of officiating. So, um, right away, I, I, you know, I took a full-time job at the bank and started officiating right away. So uh, my transition was quick. I got right into officiating right after I was done playing. And then it was just a gradual growth, um, to get better and to constantly learn. And then, uh, you know, four years later, the NHL came and invited me again to an exposure combine that, that got me hired two weeks after that. Take me through that process of what you went through uh, to become an official. I mean, you, I know you said four years later, but what steps for young people out there? Because I love talking to people like yourself that love the game of hockey. They found a job within the game of hockey without being an NHL player. But what steps do you have to go through in order to go from saying, OK, mom, dad, I want to be an NHL referee or linesman to the day that you're actually putting the stripes on and you're out there in front of 20,000 people? Well, well, first and foremost, if you're a hockey player, I'd say play the game as long as you can. Um, but for me, what, what happened was um, I, went to, I went to a camp, an uh, Ontario Minor Hockey League uh, camp that was in Guelph, Guelph, Ontario, and learned the basics, the fundamentals um, of officiating, just like I did when I first started hockey. You know, you go to camp and you, and you learn the fundamentals of the game. Um, I went to this camp. They taught me the fundamentals of the game. Kevin Pollock was actually there. And um, fortunately enough for me, I was able to, uh, to get a little bit of an award and, and have a jersey signed by all the NHL officials. And Kevin Pollock um, gave it to me at camp my, my very first year. Um, but yeah, I, I started in minor hockey. I started doing the young guys early in the morning, cold hockey rinks. Uh, and then from there, I, I just moved up. I moved up the ranks and worked on Worked every level of hockey, worked at AAA, um, OHL, OHA, Junior A, Junior B, Junior C. I just worked as much hockey as I could to get into as many different situations as I could to learn as much as of that side of the game. Because as a player, um, you know, I think, you know, as a player, you don't really know the rules as, as well as you need to to be an official, first of all. Um, but, you know, I tried to get into as many games, many different situations and just worked as many games as I could um, to to basically – uh, work my way through the ranks and, and, you know, when, get to where I am today. How does it feel having 20,000 people in the building? They're excited for the game to start. And your best night is when nobody recognizes you're out there on the ice. What is that feeling like? Because I know as a player, you want to score goals, you want to hit, you want to fight, you want to do something important to win. But a referee or linesman, as long as they're invisible and not getting in the way, that's a great night for you guys wearing the stripes. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great night, but honestly, the, the fans kind of, the fans jacked me up too, just like they do with the players. They jack us up too. I think, I think it kind of pushes us to be a little bit better when the fans are yelling, you know, ref, you suck, or come on guys. Like, you know, I think it kind of jacks us up to, to get ready and be more into the game and be, and be better than, than we are currently in the game. But, um, you know, again, like you said, the best nights are when you're not noticed. And, um, you know, just being in front of 20,000 fans is a rush and to, to be there and, and be part of the game and be right in the game. Uh, it, it's an amazing feeling, whether you're cheering for you or not. So what you're saying is you could actually hear what people are saying to you on the ice. I used to get frustrated when refs used to skate by. I used to chirp at them and they would skate by. So I thought, hey, maybe this guy's got a hearing problem. He can't really hear me. <laughs> so I got the double minder, the game is conduct. And then I knew, hey, I got his attention. You know, it's funny. Sometimes, sometimes you're so focused, you don't hear anything. I remember one night 
um, John Tortorella was trying to get my attention. And I was, I was so focused on what was going on. Finally, I realized he was yelling at me. And I, I said, John, I'm working here. I'll, as soon as we, as soon as we get a stop at Joe play, I'll come talk to you. But right now I'm working. I can't, I can't do two things at once. I got to be paying attention to the game. He's like, okay, as long as you hear me, that's good. <laughs> Who are some of the other vocal coaches out there um, that love to talk and like try to be communicative during the course of a hockey game? Um, you know what? Most of them are, most of them are pretty good. Most of them realize that we're out there working and, and try and do their job. Um, and, and then, you know, at the stoppage of the play is when we usually do our talking. It was just, it was that one time I remember he was, he didn't like a call I made and he just wanted an explanation. And I said, I'll absolutely give you an explanation, just not during play. Cause I can't talk to you and do this at the same time. But mo most guys, you know, realize we're out there working. And then when, when the right time to talk, we'll, we'll come right to the bench and talk to anybody. Yeah. I've noticed all the linesmen or referees that I've encountered in the course of my career. If you're respectful for the, to them, they're usually respectful to you. And during the, the heat of the battle, sometimes you'll be yelling back and forth, but you're right. Once the play stops, you come over, you can have a conversation. That usually has a chance to just let everything settle right down. You move on to the next play. Uh, what would you say would be the toughest part of your job? The toughest part of my job is, is definitely being away from the family. Uh, you know, for, for us, we don't have uh, 41 home games like the, like the players do. So, you know, we're, we're away from the family quite a bit. But, but honestly, I love everything about this job, and, and that is the only thing that's the hard thing about our job. Everything else um, really doesn't feel like a job. We're out there um, on the ice, for, in my opinion, working the best game in the world and uh, right in the middle of the game. So um, there, there's, there's not many things bad about our job, but being away from the family for me, I have young kids that I'd love to be able to be at the rink all the time um so you know that's the only thing that's hard for me and what's more difficult the mental grind or the physical grind of being a linesman because you got to keep up with these young players but also you have to be mentally focused for 60 minutes you can't afford to have a shift off because if you do <laughs> everyone's gonna notice I, I would say i would say the mental grind's the toughest for me personally everyone's different but the physical grind i i love it i love the physicality about the game that was that was one of the biggest parts of my game so the physical part, getting right in there, breaking up the scrums, breaking up the fights. Um, you know, actually, last game I worked, I almost got, I was almost in the middle of a big collision, big hit, and, and I love it. So all the physical stuff is, is the is one of the best parts of my job. Um, but the mental grind, you're right. Sixty minutes, we got to be on it. And even you know, even when the whistle goes, is almost when we have to be most on it. Is when mm -hmm. the when some of the dust ups happen, and we have to be right in there to, to break them up. So, um, you know, the mental part is, is the toughest and to stay focused, especially with no fans in the building right now, everyone needs to stay focused and stay into the game. Hockey can be an emotional game. You talk about the, the physical dust ups just now. Did you ever encounter any players slinging any racial slurs your way uh, in the heat of the moment? And if so, how did you react? As a player, uh, absolutely, I, I did. Um, like I said, I was, I was one of the better players growing up. So, um, you know, as, as a younger kid, I, I didn't react very, very good. Um, I hurt my teammates in terms of getting penalties because, you know, the, the players wouldn't be in earshot of the referee. So I'd react and then I tell the referee what happened and they didn't hear it. There's nothing they could do about it. Um, so, you know, I'd be taking penalties. I'd be, I'd be hurting my teammates in that aspect, um, reacting negatively to it. But once I started officiating, um, I put my goal of, of making it to the NHL ahead of what was said to me. So I was able to, to, um, take a step back, um, you know, take in what they said and, and take the proper avenues to report what had happened and not react the way I did when I was a kid on the ice, uh, and, you know, maybe go after someone and take a penalty. So, um, fortunately for me, since I've got into professional hockey, I haven't had any experiences, uh, only positive experiences. Um, so, um, I haven't had any negative experiences like that, but as a kid, you know, I, I would say, I would say, do your best as a kid. If you're in the game and, and something like that happens, do your best to, to let your love of the game um, go ahead of what someone is saying to you and don't let anyone um, turn you away from doing what you love. What you just said just struck a nerve with me because this is why diversity and inclusion is so important now with hockey going forward because you would hear something on the ice, someone would say a racial slur to you, but then you felt bad that you're letting your teammates down 
based on your reaction. Like that shouldn't happen. You shouldn't feel bad for someone that had to experience someone saying this racially charged comment to you. Now that, that's why you've got to eradicate this out of the sport completely because it has to be more of an inclusive sport. It has to be more of a sport that wraps its arms around uh, our players, regardless of what your gender is, or your color is, it shouldn't matter. So that what you said to me is reason number one, why um, these conversations are so important. Absolutely. Now, who did you look up to as an official? And I think it might be pretty obvious. And I don't want to say Wes McCauley. So Wes, if you're out there, we're not talking about you. And we can talk about Wes McCauley all we want because he's one of the great officials in the game, former captain of Michigan State University. But I want to talk about Jay and what impact Jay's had, Jay shares uh, on your career and being the first black official in the National Hockey League. Um, Jay Shares has had a, a huge impact on me. Um, you know, without a doubt, he, he paved the way for me to, to do exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, and not only to, to do it, but to know that it's a possibility for me to do it at the highest level. And, and, and you know, when I, think of, when I think of Jay Shares, the first thing that comes to mind for me isn't that he was the first black official. It's that he is one of the best to have ever done the job, whether he, um, you know, the fact that he did break the color barrier is huge, but not only did he break the color barrier and get into the league, he excelled. He had an extremely successful career, worked multiple Stanley cup finals, over 2000 hockey games in the national hockey league. Um, the man, the man's incredible. And what he did for the, for, for a guy like myself and for young officials coming up, that uh, that look at him and look at his career and absolutely can think there is 100% a spot for me in that position. If Jay shares can do what he, what he has done in his career. Yeah. I remember the first time I came on the ice and Jay was on the ice and I looked over and I had a double take. I was like, wait, hold on a second. What we've had a black official in the national hockey league. I don't think any of the other guys might've noticed but usually when I walk into the room, there isn't many people that look like me, and I'm pretty comfortable with that. So to have someone that looked like me as an official, that really caught me off guard. But I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I always made a point to look for Jay whenever we played. And I didn't look for any extra special attention, like in, in a call offside or whatever, or not jump in a scrum or whatever. But just seeing him there made me think that, wow, hockey is really for everybody. And you don't have to be a National Hockey League player to participate in our amazing game. Absolutely. And Jay's, Jay's done that for so many young kids coming up. And, uh, and you know, like, like you said, there, there are so many good role models, great role models that, that kids have coming up that we didn't have necessarily when we were younger. And Jay didn't have when he was younger. So th this generation of kids coming up is so, so blessed to have these people to look up to and see what they're doing and see what they have done and to be able to have the confidence to chase their dreams. So I, I think it's, I think it's an amazing thing. How do you think, and give me a suggestion of what you would think would make sense to increase the number of colored officials in the national hockey league. How do we increase that pipeline to say that there's more Jays and the more Shandors coming down the pipe in years to come? I think we got to go to, to the grassroots and, and basically introduce officiating to kids that are, that are playing hockey and kids that love the game. Um, I, th I think a lot of young hockey players, uh, the only thought is I want to make it to the NHL as a player. And, and, you know, not all kids, um, not all kids want to be a player in the NHL, but love the game and maybe have, other things that that interest them, whether it's broadcasting or coaching or or officiating. So I think I think you need to introduce officiating to kids um, and and tell them it's a, it's a great opportunity to to improve your skills or improve yourself as a hockey player. I think knowing the rules is a great way to improve yourself as a hockey player. Um, and and officiating is a great way to put a little bit of money in your jeans for for young kids coming up as well. You know, you don't have to ask. Maybe maybe you don't have to ask mom and dad for that extra allowance because you're you're earning a little bit of extra money yourself. So I think I think introducing them at a at a young age, and then also, um, you know, when when I was coming up uh, in the in the juniors, I played in Sudbury for in the OHL. Um, officiating wasn't really something that was top of mind. And, and at the time, I, I had an idea in my head that I wasn't going to make it to the NHL as a player. 
still wanted to be there. Um, so I think if that was introduced to me then as well, maybe in my overage year or my fourth year, um, introduced to, as an opportunity to, for some, for a way for you to stay in the game. I think there's, I think that's a great thing that people can do that the, the officiating world could do to introduce more people to the game, more people of color to the game as well. I think also to the aspect that you guys are a team, you know, your four officials are a team. I remember going to MSG uh, last year, the year before and, and wheel West Macaulay was calling the game and I went in the officials room to say hi. And he's like, come on, Ace, come on, come see the boys, come say hi to the boys. And it was like a tight knit group, all the officials in there. Like you had the Rangers on one side, you had the Bruins on the other side, and you had the officials together. And it was a unique feeling because I'd never been in an officials room before, but you guys are your own little team. I mean, how great a feeling is that to have that camaraderie yeah. as opposed to being in like an actual NHL team? I, I think that that's one of the things I most loved about the game. You know, I, I left the game as a player and I never, I never lost that camaraderie. I went from a team of 20 to a team of three or four. And, and it, it, you know, that, that dressing room, very similar to a hockey dressing room where people are giving each other a hard time. There's pranks, there's laughs, there's jokes. Um, so, um, I mean, the, that's one of the greatest aspects of fishing, and something that a lot of people don't know. Um, when, I, when I went to the combine um, and, and we, we ran it out of Buffalo, and I remember – Justin Peters came out and he watched us. We were doing our drills and going through our drills. And he goes, what are you guys doing out here? And we're, we're like, we're, we're working out. We're working on our skating. We're doing power skating. He's like, I didn't know you guys trained to be officials. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's lots of things about the officiating world that, that people don't know. And, um, you know, a lot of people, I mean, as a player, I looked at officials and I was like, ah, these guys, you know, they don't seem... But when you get into it, you realize they're just hockey guys that love the game and, and maybe weren't great hockey players, but were decent hockey players. And some of them maybe stopped playing at a younger age, but love the game and, and just want to be part of the game and, and are definitely part of the game because you can't play the game without us. And yeah, we can't undersell the amount of training you guys do. It's not like you guys are baseball umpires. That's not happening. You guys put in a lot of work. There's no shifts off for you guys you guys are consistently on the ice for the course of 60 minutes which is amazing uh, i just want to follow up on the point you made too about increasing the bipoc pipeline i think also doing things like these making yourself available because people don't really see officials as having a personality like and that's part of your responsibility your role in the game is you're a faceless entity but having someone like yourself being out there, being visible, having Wes McCauley, one of the biggest personalities in hockey alone, just putting the face to the stripes. Let's people understand you guys are human. And also, it also has people, like, lets people recognize that maybe there's something for me because I always thought referees were robots. And then I get to the league and some of those guys have great, like Stewie, unbelievable, great personalities. So I, I gained a, a further respect, and a lot of respect for those guys wearing the stripes because I understand how tough your job is. And you wear a lot less protection than the players do on the ice. And it's hard to skate without a stick, too. It's very hard to skate without a stick. That, that was definitely the first thing that, that came that was, that was, for me, the hardest, the transition, was learning to skate without a stick because we're so used to doing everything with a stick in our hand. Uh, that was a bit hard, the hardest transition. But you know what? Humanizing, humanizing our – our profession has, has been, you know, it's a great thing for, for everyone really realizing we're human beings and we're just out there to do what's right for the game. Not, uh, not benefit anybody, honestly, on any given night, I, I don't care who wins the hockey game. Our, our job is to uphold the integrity of the game. That's our only job, whether it's, um, it doesn't matter what teams are playing. We're just out there to do our job and do it the best that we can. That's one other thing that I want people to know. We, we all want to be the best. We all are striving to work that Stanley Cup final game um, with Wes. <laughs> um, but at, at the end of the day, we just we want to do our best and we want to do what's best for the hockey game. Well, Shandor, I can't thank you enough. This has been a great conversation here with Hockey Culture. I appreciate you joining us. I appreciate you making time. I know you've got a crazy schedule. And I don't care what Wes says. Keep asking questions. That's the only way that you learn. You continue to educate yourself and show further growth. Um, that I've seen so far because I've been totally impressed with your career and I'll be watching you going forward. And hopefully, I'll be seeing you doing a lot of Stanley Cup Finals games too. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Anson. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Anytime. Thank you.